Welcome uh, this morning in the name of 
Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. My name is Warren Brosey, one of the ministers here at Berlin Christian Church. We're glad to worship Jesus with you today. For those who are online, we're glad that you're here uh, to listen and to join us in worship. Uh, today we're talking about how exiles make prayer a mission. And we're getting that theme verse from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7, which is a letter to exiles. And it says this, Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And so we want to take some time throughout our service today to pray. And a couple different times in the sermon, we will be praying uh, for our community. And I reached out to some of our leaders in our communities nearby, some uh, principals and superintendent, mayor, and things like that, and just said, hey, what, are we, what can we pray about in our service today? And one of the requests that, that I received was, we want to pray for our schools to be a safe place for children and staff, free from violence, and we that we can create an environment where students can learn and flourish. And so that's one prayer that we can pray for our communities today. And uh, I want to just invite you to pray with me as we uh, open up our service today. So let's pray. Father in heaven, you are the living one, and your kingdom endures forever. We pray for the peace and prosperity of our communities, as you say in your scripture. Lord, grant your favor to our neighbors and bless them with health and your mercy. As we gather in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we profess that you break the power of sin and darkness. You are the King of glory. You bring order out of chaos. You make orphans, sons, and daughters. We praise you and worship you in the mighty name of Jesus who conquered the grave and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Your life. 
you've done for me. Sing worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Day for all he has done for us. Strong. 
The center, the youth center, held a welcome back party, and they reported that this was an overwhelming experience in that they had a target goal of 80 students to attend. Um, they had over 100 respond to the invitation, so they prepared food for 120 students and recorded that they had an attendance of about 140. So even though they ran out of food, they felt that this was a huge success, so praise the Lord. Um, they wouldn't be able to do this to share the gospel um, through, through such activities without our generous giving. Uh, last week, Warren gave us a beautiful synopsis of what it looks like when we give here at this church. Your gifts help to spread the good news of Jesus, both in our community and around the globe. Um, what an incredible blessing, but also an opportunity that we have. Um, we are a giving church, and God wants his followers to be a giving body of Christ. So today's offering is going to center around a question. What does God expect from me? Or what does God expect from us? Today's scripture will be from Deuteronomy, and Moses is going to give us a simple summary of what that looks like. What does God want from us? He wants us to fear him, to revere him and respect, have respect for him. He wants us to please him by following him. He wants us to love him. He wants us to serve him with all of our hearts and our souls, not just when it's convenient. And he wants us to observe his commands. So I think at times we can complicate our faith in Christ by adding rules, regulations, when at the core he simply wants us to respect, follow, love, serve, and obey him. So from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, uh, Moses is teaching us to fear the Lord. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for today, and we pray that this service and this offering gives glory to you. We pray for strength to resist the world and instead respect, follow, love, serve, and obey you. We thank you and we praise your name for the hope that you give us and we hope that through our obedience to you, you delight in us. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to turn your hearts towards our time of communion today. At Berlin Christian Church, we practice open communion, open communion which means that any followers of Jesus are invited to participate with us. Uh, you'll find the uh, cups stacked uh, with the juice on top and the bread on the bottom, and you can take those as trays are passed and receive as uh, you're ready. Our reading today comes from uh, Doug Redford from uh, ChristianStandard.com. In these technological times, many have fallen victim to identity theft. Those of you who have experienced this know what an ordeal it can be when you are to, to have your identity restored. There is, however, an even more sinister identity theft that has been going on in the spiritual realm since God's creation of human beings. Satan has attempted to rob us of our standing as people created in the image of God with a purpose, worth, and dignity. His efforts shattered the harmony between God and Adam and Eve, and he has been on the prowl like a roaring lion ever since. Jesus said of Satan, he has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies, from John 8, 44. So how did Jesus address the issue of our identity, our identity theft? Stealing Satan's identity was out of the question. Jesus' solution was not identity theft of Satan, but the, what amounted to Jesus' identity loss. Philippians 2, 6-8 says it best. Who being in very nature God, speaking of Jesus, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself before, by becoming obedient to death even death on the cross. Jesus experienced that identity loss so we could regain our identity that we have created, 
that we were created to have. See what great love the Father has lavished on us? And that is that, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are, from 1 John 3, 1. Paul tells us that at communion we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We look back on the event that made it possible for our true God-given identity to be restored. But we realize that we are still works in progress. Jesus is coming again will mark the day when our identity in, be, in becomes complete. As John went on to say in 1 John 3, what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that we, when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In heaven, the identity theft carried out by Satan will be fully and eternally reversed, and the thief himself will be eternally banished. Let's pray together. Father, today we remember what it took to restore our, our identity uh, with the Father, and it was your broken body and your spilled blood. We thank you and we celebrate um, that you loved us that much to give of yourself, to reduce yourself to nothing and be obedient to the cross. We thank you for the resurrection, God, that proves uh, that you have conquered death and sin forever. We just uh, enjoy this and celebrate it today as we partake of these elements. We pray it in the name of Christ Jesus, our risen Savior. Amen. You're the God of this city, you're the King of these people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are, you're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless, you are, there is no one like I. is no one like our God. The greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. You're the God of this city, you're the King of these people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are, you're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless, you are, there is no
Your mission, should you choose to accept it as exiles, is to make prayer your mission. It kind of sounds like one of those, you know, this message will self-destruct in X amount of seconds. So are you ready to be prayer warriors for our communities, for our cities? As we get started, I want to uh, just, again, read that verse from, from Jeremiah, and then we're going to be in Daniel 6 the rest of our time. But I think it's important to hear this verse again. Jeremiah says to those who are living in exile, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And so uh, and we're going to lead a prayer in a minute, but I just want to uh, hear you shout out. And so this is your cue to, I need people to talk. I don't want the awkward silence. It's a, it's a very simple question. And for those of you who are online, I'd love for you to participate too by uh, putting in the comments. I just want to know your hometown. And so you can say, you know, where you, you live, you know, what's on your address or your hometown where you grew up. And I just want you to think about where we're, we're going to share these communities. Ooh, I'm starting to, get, I'm starting to cry already. <laughs> but I want to be praying for our communities, our hometowns. So just shout out uh, where you live. I know mean, a lot of us live in the same place, but I know there's some other places represented. And also think back to where you grew up. So let's just shout them out. Where's you from? Chicago. Okay. <laughs> Not all at once, though. Should I hear Chicago? And I say Chapin. Springfield. New Berlin, Low Amy. Low Amy. Thank you, Ethan, for serving. Farmersville, Polo, Harrisburg. I heard St. Elmo, Pleasant Plains. I can't hear it say Canton, Root House, Root House. I got the R H from from Philip. Root House, Root House. You can do this. R, Root House. Good. A couple others I heard. Grand Junction. Grand Junction. Hanover Park. Hanover Park. Seneca, Missouri is where I grew up. Quincy. Lou. Michelstadt, Germany. Beat that one. Huh? <laughs> you get the award for coming the furthest away from home today. So. Maybe some people are online. They'll, they'll click in and see some cool places too. So, Anyone else want to give a shout out? Payson, Brighton, Hull. Did I say it right? Good. It's cool to hear our hometowns. And there, I mean, there's some pride in our hometown, isn't there? And rightfully so. That's, that's part of who we are and formational moments. And this is our home now. Berlin. I didn't hear Berlin. <laughs> uh, Berlin. <laughs> Uh, like some of us live here, and so uh, yeah, we're all, this is this is home. This is where we live, and so you know Jeremiah through the Holy Spirit says, "You pray for your city where I've carried you into exile, where you live, because, and pray for the peace of it, and pray that it would prosper. Because if it prospers, you're going to prosper." And I just want to take a moment here as we get into this message, just to be thinking about how we can, as followers of Jesus, living in exile, because there's a culture that's hostile to the ways of Jesus, but we can go on mission by praying for our communities. And one of the other things I just want to just kind of, as we walk through this sermon today, just ask God, what, what part of my community do you want me to be praying about? You know, maybe it's school, maybe it's neighbors, maybe it's your workplace, but I just, I'm praying right now that God would just say, open your eyes and, and kind of pierce your heart and say, okay, this is what I'm going to dedicate some focused prayer time to in the next days or weeks, however you feel that too. Again, I, I asked for some, some prayer requests, um, and uh, I got uh, a couple, one from, from Pleasant Plains, uh, uh, two-year-old, oh, this is a hard one. There's a two-year-old by the name of Grayson Robinson who was recently diagnosed with stage four neuroblastoma. Well, there's a two-year-old in our community. And so uh, that was requested uh, by Mrs. Greer, the principal at Pleasant Plains High School. So we're going to pray for Grayson. Um, one of the other first people I asked up at the Village Hall in New Berlin, I said, we're going to be praying for our community this week. What should we pray about? And... Uh, like it's kind of a common, everything, but it said peace, prayers for peace in this world. And did you notice that's what, what Jeremiah said? Pray for the peace of your city. 
So we're going to pray uh, for peace. We're going to pray for this uh, little boy, um, Grayson. Uh, I got some other prayer requests uh, as well um, from one, one of the other leaders in our school. Uh, it says, I ask that you pray for our school to be a safe place for our children and staff can grow to be their personal best in day in and day out. Uh, she asks, I ask that our community be safe and proud to live in such an amazing part of central Illinois. I ask that our community and school community work together to mentor, guide, and support our children by providing examples and modeling perseverance, resilience, grit, and accountability. You're going to hear that word resilience later on in the sermon. I'm glad I got that prayer request too. So you hear some of those, and so we're just going to pray right now for some of these requests that have been submitted by members in our community and some of them in leadership roles. And so uh, let's go ahead and just pray right now. Uh, Lord Jesus, um, we just ask for your help. We also want to say thank you for how you are moving through this church family. Uh, we lift up every community that was just named uh, some is where we call home right now, some where, um, where we grew up, maybe it was years, decades ago, but it's still important to you. And Lord, I want to pray for the peace of our communities. We pray for healing in the name of Jesus for Grayson Robinson. I pray you watch over his mom and dad and his family, uh, send helpers their way, Holy Spirit. And Lord, I unite with my brothers and sisters in this room, for those who are listening online, watching, uh, that we just unite our hearts right now in prayer for grace and, and ask for healing in the name of Jesus, knowing you can do all things. Lord, we pray for our schools to be safe for our children and staff. Help them to grow to be their personal best day in and day out. We pray that our communities would be safe and that they'd just be proud to live in an amazing place here in Illinois. I also pray for healthy and strong partnerships with our community and our schools to work together, to mentor, to guide and support our children. Help us as followers of Jesus to provide examples, to model perseverance, resilience, grit, and accountability. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus who conquered the grave through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And thank you for Mrs. Larson uh, to submit some of those requests as well and some of our other principles. So as we walk through, I want to invite you now to Daniel chapter 6. We're looking at Daniel chapter 6, and um, Daniel's a man of prayer. At least three times you walk through the book of Daniel, Daniel is praying. In chapter 2, he's praying. Uh, you know, the Nebuchadnezzar has that dream. You need to tell me what I dreamed and then tell me what the dream meant. And the advisor is like, nobody can do that. Only God can. And so Daniel gets his friends say, we better pray. And so they pray and ask for help for that dream. God answers the prayer. Here in chapter 6, we're going to find out that Daniel had a habit of praying was consistent modeling prayer. And then in chapter 9, it's probably the longest prayer of Daniel. He really confesses. of like, Lord, we've sinned. We need your help. I confess our wrongdoing. And so I want to encourage you just to kind of go spend some time in Daniel chapter 9 uh, later this week as well to hear some more of Daniel's prayers. But Daniel's a prayerful person. And so as exiles who make prayer a mission, uh, there's three, three attributes that, that prayer helps us with. One, prayer centers our character. Prayer centers our character. Uh, we find this in the first handful of verses, Daniel chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to follow along. There's a, on, it's on page 725 in the Bible there in front of you. But Daniel chapter 6, we'll look at the first uh, five verses. Daniel 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius. Darius is now the new king on the block. He, it went from Nebuchadnezzar through Daniel chapter 4, Daniel 5, Nebuchadnezzar's son Belshazzar becomes king, has a dream, and is assassinated. And now Darius the Mede comes into power. So Daniel outlived the Babylonian empire. Daniel by this time is probably in his 80s. So he's an older man. And listen to uh, what's happening in his life. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps. Those are like governors 
uh, to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. So Daniel's like one of the top three administrators over the kingdom. Remember, he's in exile. He's in exile from, from Jerusalem. The satraps were made accountable to them so the king might not suffer loss. Verse 3, now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of the government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So Daniel is one of these uh, blameless type characters, no corruption. Wouldn't you like to see that, you know, him run for office? There's no corruption, nothing uh, against him. He's not negligent. He's trustworthy, exceptional qualities. He is a superb example of what it looks like to follow after God. And he's got great character. And I think part of that comes out of his prayerful life. Because let's be honest, if you're praying to, to the Lord, do you think your sin is going to be less? Don't you think a praying life is going to lead to a holy life? And so they're, they're, the administrators are jealous of Daniel. They're trying to trump up some charges. They're trying to find something. And they're fi- figuring out the only way we're going to get around this guy is to find something with his faith. And they're going to attack him through his faith. And so I wanted to think about how prayer centers our character. We talked a few weeks ago about how there's this book, Faith for Exiles, by David Kinnaman, Mark Matlock. They did this survey of 18 to 29-year-olds who grew up in the church, grew up as Christians, and they surveyed them after they, after they left the house. And are you still following Jesus? 10% who grew up as Christians were described as resilient disciples of Jesus meant that they loved Jesus, they believed the, the truths of Scripture, and they were actively serving Him. Only 10%. And so this is some of the, the convictions that they found uh, for these, these resilient disciples. And one of the practices to disciple them is to uh, ground and motivate an ambitious generation, train for, discipleship, for, train for vocational discipleship. So to ground this uh, generation that loves to do, they want to help, they want to get active, they want to make a difference, train them in vocational discipleship, which means whatever you do with your work, you can be a disciple maker. Whatever you do for work, you can give God glory. Your workplace is a mission field where you can live out your faith in a ways that, that advance God's kingdom. You may have to be creative, but they view your work as, I'm going to love Jesus and love love my supervisors, co-workers, and just make a difference wherever they go for work. And here were some of their convictions. Resilient disciples are God-centered in their thinking about work and calling. So they're like, God has a specific thing he wants me to do. He's called me to this, and I want to use my work as a way to just give God glory. Resilient disciples believe that God designs each person with a unique calling in their life. Also, resilient disciples believe integrity in the workplace matters no matter the type of work. That shouldn't surprise us that as Christians, we should be honest and loyal and honor those around us. And so as followers of Jesus, we see this lived out in the life of Daniel, don't we? No corruption, trustworthy, not negligent, exceptional qualities. So as we go through our work week or school week, are we looking for opportunities just to bless people with truth and kindness and a good service? D.L. Moody says that the Christian shoemaker doesn't necessarily give God glory by putting little crosses on shoes, but by making good shoes. And so the idea that we use our work to advance God's kingdom by the way we go about our work. There's a verse from Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul um, gives to this uh, small town church. I want to invite you to 
follow along, it's on page 955 in the Bible in front of you. But Colossians chapter 3 has some things to talk about work. And this is something we could probably do better at church. Just I'm talking about preachers. A lot of times we, we probably need to equip our people better with how do you follow Jesus in the workplace, okay? Uh, and because we spend a lot of time in our workplaces, don't we, in, in the schools. And so what are ways that we can just live out our faith in the workplace? I think these are some instructions here that Paul gives. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 um, it says slaves or, or bond servants. It's this kind of indentured servant almost experience, but it can kind of overlap with employee-employer relationships. Obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So whenever you go off to work, yes, you have a supervisor. There is an owner of your company or business, but there's someone who is over them, and that's Jesus. So think about how you go through your work week, your school week, and remember that ultimately you are serving Jesus by how you go about your work. And so Daniel was living that out, a man of character. He uh, was a prayerful person that we're going to find out here in a few moments because the, the adversaries figured out the only way we're going to get around him is find something with his faith. And so they go to work. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 6. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king, King Darius. May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, governors, those are all the ruling leaders, uh, have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, one, that's a lie because it says all of them agreed. I don't think Daniel signed off on that one. But they're trying to say, okay, uh, this guy loves to pray to God. So if we say that everybody's got to pray to you, O king, for the next 30 days, then maybe we can catch Daniel. Now, it's a little bit different, but it's somewhat similar to the, this story in, in Daniel 6. And you think about Daniel 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And King Nebuchadnezzar at the time builds the golden statue, the golden image, and everybody's got to bow down to the image. So that's something you must do. This one, Daniel could have, I guess, tried to skate around and say, well, I just won't pray for the next 30 days. But for Daniel, that wasn't an option. Now, your majesty, verse 8, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel, this is verse 10 and 11, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. So he's getting ready to pray. He can pray anywhere. Why is he opening his windows toward Jerusalem? Where's Daniel? He's in one of the most powerful cities in the world, Babylon, one of the most luxurious cities, one of the most uh, powerful cities. And yet he's going to open his windows to Jerusalem. That's his hometown. That's the town where David set up and Solomon built the temple. But it's been generations before, since that temple was glorious. It's burned down rubble the last time he saw it. Broken down city. And yet he turns his attention to Jerusalem because that's where his king has his throne on earth. It's the king of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, his king. And so he opens his windows to Jerusalem, even though it's a broken down city, coming back to life under Darius and Cyrus' uh, reigns, but it still, you know, doesn't make sense physically speaking. So he gets, opens the windows toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed. 
giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about the royal decree. Did you not publish that during the next 30 days anyone who prays to any god or human being except you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, this which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed, and he was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sunset to save him. I want you to look at the prayer practices of Daniel from verses 10 and 11. Look what Daniel does in his prayers. He prays three times a day, at least, probably more, but it says that he prays three times a day. He got down on his knees. How old is he again? probably in his 80s. A lot of us can get down on our knees. Some of us can't quite get back up off of our knees. He was in good shape. He gave thanks to God, and he asked God for help. Pretty simple, really, when you look at it, isn't it? I mean, other than the whole knee thing, that's not hard to do. So I just want to encourage you as we continue this, what's God stirring in you? Where, how does he want to grow your, your prayers, your relationship with him? Here are a couple more prayer requests I got, and then we're going to pray. And if you want to get on your knees, you can. I'm not going to force anybody to, because like I said, some of you might be able to get down there and can't get up. But maybe there's a posture where you would like to just symbolically, you know, whether it's lower your head or however you want to engage in this next moment of a prayer. I invite you to, but I'm going to read the prayer request, and then we'll pray. Uh, another one, uh, this one, uh, he lives across the street from me. It's our mayor. He asks for health and happiness, uh, that we'd be safe, prosperous winter, those in despair to have strength to reach out to someone who is able to help bear their burdens. Sounds a little biblical, doesn't it? Bear one another's burdens, and thus you'll fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6. Also ask prayers for families in our community who have lost loved ones. We want to pray for God's grace and peace and comfort for them. And this week, we're going to host two funerals uh, here. So I want to be praying for those families, the Jim Crawford family uh, and Alice Henning. We're going to be hosting their services in this room. So we have an opportunity to pray for our community through that as well. Uh, One of our other uh, members here, uh, she just encourages me to say, if you feel led to pray for a certain part of your community, go for it. And then take the awkward step to just tell someone about it. Hey, I'm going to be praying for you. What can I pray for you about? So how does God want you to be praying right now? So I invite you, if you want to join me on your knees, you can, or bow your head, however you feel led to, but let's pray right now for these requests. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for people like Daniel who love you and who were bold and gifted and faithful. And I pray that we can embrace those um, attributes of praying regularly and displaying humility in whatever posture that makes sense for us, that we would give you thanks, that we would just ask for help. And so right now we do ask for help for our communities. We pray for health and for happiness and for safety and prosperity for our communities. I do want to pray for those who are in despair and discouraged and weak, that you would give them the opportunity and the strength they need to reach out to someone who can help carry those burdens. And Lord, as followers of Jesus, help us to have eyes to see those needs right in front of us and to pause and to offer to help. I pray for the families in our community who have lost loved ones. I pray that they would find hope in you, Jesus. I want to pray that as we host funerals this week, that we could show love and truth and kindness and mercy and compassion to those who are grieving. We pray for grace, peace, and comfort. 
Lord, I want to pray for boldness for all of us right now in this moment. Clue us in on what we should be praying about. Put a burden on our heart right now, whether it's for our community or a mission or a school or a teacher or a leader in our community or a neighbor, that you would just put that on our heart right now and give us the boldness to just reach out to them and say, hey, I want to pray for you. What, what's something I can be praying about? Lord, we want to be a praying people and watch you advance your kingdom mission through us. We pray this through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen. Prayer aligns our allegiance. That's what's happening here in this section. Prayer aligns our allegiance because he was looking to Jerusalem even though he's living in Babylon. His eyes were on the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Christopher Wright says it this way, Daniel's prayer life kept him in touch with a higher authority than Darius. And no edict would change that, not even the law of the Medes and the Persians. So prayer centers our character. Prayer aligns our allegiance to someone higher than the earthly rulers around. And then number three, prayer empowers our mission. Prayer empowers our mission. I just want to pick up the rest of the story. Daniel has been ratted out by those leaders. Darius is put into a corner. I wasn't expecting Daniel, my best man, to get thrown into the pit of lions. He's not so happy. He rashly made that decree and was put in under pressure from, from governing leaders. And so he, at verse, end of verse 14, Darius is greatly distressed. He's like, I've got to rescue Daniel. He made every effort until sundown. Verse 15, then the men went as a group to King Darius and said, hey, remember your majesty that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. What are you going to do about Daniel? They're forcing his hand. So the king gave the order. I'm not sure how he gave that order, but I'm sure it was kind of a lump in his mouth, a lump in his throat. And so he gave the order, and they brought Daniel, and they threw him into the lion's den. And again, I don't know how that works. If, they, if it's a, 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 if we're talking about a cave, and they're pushing him in the side. If it's some opening from the top, and they're dropping him in. But however, uh, he's, he's tossed in to the lion's. And then the king says this at the end of verse 16 to Daniel. May your God, whom you, continually, whom you serve continually, rescue you. He recognizes that Daniel is faithful. May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation may not be changed. Maybe they had some wax and they all pushed their little rings in and said, you know, if this seal gets broken, we know somebody rescued him or someone tampered with this. And so there's that seal, makes it official. Verse 18, then the king returned to his palace, spent the night without entertainment, without eating. Uh, he could not sleep, sleepless night. Verse 19, at first light of dawn, the king got up, hurried to the lion's den. What would you expect? I mean, let's be honest. Lions, probably full bellies, no Daniel. I mean, let's, that's, is that what you would expect? Let's be honest. That's what should happen. And so he goes, opens the, the cave op, up. Verse 20, when he came near the den, he called out to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, take note of that, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you? Daniel answered. Did you catch that? <laughs> what? Daniel answered. He, I, I don't know what he was expecting. Daniel answered, may the king live forever. That shows something about how you treat your enemies. You're the one that threw me in here, remember. May you live forever, respectful of the king. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. 
nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, your majesty. It's pretty clear, state in this case, I've done no wrong. God sent an angel. Fine. Verse 23, the king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted up from the den, no wound was found on him. Sounds a little bit like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember, that fourth man was in the fire, looked like a son of the gods. And they come out and they don't even smell like smoke. This is the second time that God is able to rescue his children from certain death. He gave orders. Uh, when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because Daniel had trusted in his God. Now, this is a great story. But not, it doesn't always end this way. There's sometimes they get thrown to the lion's den, they serve God faithfully, they trust God completely, and they still die. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Even if God doesn't rescue us, we still will not bow. But in this moment... God had this purpose to rescue Daniel. At the king's command, the men who were, had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and their children. Sin has its consequences, my friends. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. <laughs> Didn't need that part, did we? That usually doesn't get taught in a Sunday school lesson with the little flannel grass, you remember? Oh, yeah, and by the way, kids, everyone else died. <laughs> crunch, crunch, crunch. Daniel, praying person, prayer empowers our mission. Again, the Apostle Paul has something to say about praying. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, I, f I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving, remember Daniel thanked God, asked God for help, thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. We are called to pray for our leaders, pray for those who are in authority, for peace. Again, Christopher Wright reminds us, the prayer of God's people is for the good of the world, not just the church. So let's see how we can advance God's kingdom mission through our prayers. As you think about Darius and Daniel, there's another story of another governing leader who was kind of pushed into a corner too. And there was an innocent man brought before him as well. Think about King Darius and Pontius Pilate. Both had innocent people in front of them, Daniel, Jesus. Both had lots of peer pressure. Remember what you said, if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar's. Both encountered righteous men. Darius was determined to rescue Daniel. He made every effort until sundown to save him. Pilate, you may recall from Matthew 27, 24, brought out water, washed his hands. I'm innocent of this man's blood. Daniel, Darius sent Daniel to the lion's den. Pilate had Jesus flogged and sent to a cross. God saved Daniel from the lion's. But Jesus endured the cross before his divine rescue. While Jesus is on the cross, Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he continued on in verse 13, Psalm twenty-two, thirteen: 13, Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. David wrote that psalm. First time I made that connection with roaring lions around the cross. Verse 22, Psalm, verse 21, Psalm 22. Rescue me from the mouths of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. Jesus endured the cross, was buried in a tomb. Matthew 27, verse 66. The 
Religious leaders come to Pilate. Hey, remember that deceiver said he was going to come back to life. Uh, we need some guards. So you got a guard. And they sealed the tomb of Jesus. Much like Darius and the nobles sealed that lion's den closed. Stone rolled in front of the crop grave. Stone rolled in front of the, 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 the cave there for Daniel. Then in verse 19 of Daniel 6, at the first light of dawn, the king rose and hurried off to the lion's den. And if you read your Bibles in Matthew 28, very early on the first day of the week, Mary, Mary Magdalene, they run to the tomb to check on Jesus. And in that place where they were expecting to find certain death, both Darius and the women find life. Daniel, servant of the living God, has you, the God whom you continually serve been able to rescue you? God sent an angel to rescue him from the lion's mouths. Daniel is alive and well. And in Matthew 28, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, Mary, they look at the tomb, there's an earthquake, and guess who else is there? There's an angel. Both Darius and the women go expecting death and finding life. He's not here. He's risen. Just as he said, come see the place where he lay. My friends, here's what I came today to say. Christian prayer. Note that, Christian prayer. Daniel 6, they could pray. You remember they could pray? Pray the king. So anybody can pray, but we pray to Jesus. We pray to Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's a difference. Christian prayer declares our allegiance to the kingdom mission of the living God. Listen to how Darius closes. He writes a letter, sort of like what Nebuchadnezzar did earlier in chapter 4. Daniel chapter 6, 25. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, just like he kept his boy alive in that Den of lions, just like he raises his son from the dead. He is a living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Pray for the city. If it prospers, you'll prosper. Christian prayer declares our allegiance to the kingdom mission of the living God. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for rescuing Daniel from the lions and raising Jesus from the dead. We pray for our community leaders, grant them wisdom and discernment, surround them with godly counsel, protect our families, break our hearts with what breaks yours, help us value life and stand for truth. You are the living God and you endure forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand and I want to let you know that uh, Jesus loves you. We love you too. I'm going to stay up front today just to do something different. So if you'd like to pray over something that God's stirring in your heart right now, just come down. I'd be happy to pray with you. Um, find one of the leaders here that you respect. Ask them to pray with you. I also want to let you know that on Wednesday we will be hosting the funeral for, for Jim Crawford uh, and their family. Um, and so I want to be praying for the Crawford family this week. Jim was the very first person I ever talked to from Berlin Christian Church back in the day. And so if you'd like to help uh, in that, uh, uh, we're asking that you bring some desserts for that dinner we're providing for them on Wednesday. So if you have any more questions, you can call and contact the church office. We want to pray for them. 
uh, as well. And I want to remind you of the verse from Daniel 6, 26, where it says, For he, God, is the living God. He endures forever and ever. His kingdom will never be destroyed. His dominion will never end. Let's sing. Go in peace and make prayer a mission.